Hello? So I, I guess we could start. So I'm, a, I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm a neuromuscular uh, physician. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, inclusion body myositis. That's probably my primary research and clinical interest. And I'm happy to, um, I can just start talking or I can answer questions. I want to make this work for, for you guys. Um, so um, does anyone have any, any questions? Uh, so part of my diagnosis for IBM, and I was just diagnosed a year ago, was uh, uh, I had a blood sample sent to, to Wash U, and it came back positive. Could you tell us a little bit more about the, the antibody and the an autoantibodies? So, so in, in the last uh, few years, um, there's been an autoantibody. So these are antibodies that are present in some people that, uh, that, that are markers. So we never want to say, so, so I never want to say it's causing disease because we don't know that. So it's a marker of disease. And in, in IBM, um, there was recently an autoantibody that was identified and that autoantibody is called NCT51A. That's what it's called. It is positive in about 60% of patients with sporadic IBM. That is what it is in the US. In Europe, it's positive in 30% of patients with IBM. Is that because they do the test differently there? I don't know, but that's where just, just it's, it's a brand new test and we just don't know how well it correlates. It's also positive in people with other diseases. So it's positive in some patients who don't have IBM. So it's not going to be a test that you can go and get checked like your blood pressure or like you can get, um, uh, whenever we think about tests, and so I want you to, I, I don't want you to think about the test that you get at the doctor. I don't want you to think about your, you know, uh, your white count. I don't want you to think about those because that's not the kind of test we're talking about. We're talking about a test that's brand new, okay? Been identified in the last two years. It's only clinically available by three labs in the entire world, okay? This is a brand new test. And we don't know what we call the sensitivity and specificity of this test. We know the sensitivity and specificity of this test uh, in, 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 uh, in groups of maybe 40 patients all right, that were done on a research basis, but we don't know how that applies to the whole world. And so why is that important? So the sensitivity suggests that if somebody, uh, so the specificity means that if you don't have it, that means you don't have IBM, okay? We already know that's not true. It's not a specific test. We know that because I just told you that 70% of patients in my opinion, in the U.S., don't have it and they still have IBM. So the specificity is, I mean, that's not a, that's not a good, that's not what you think of as a good test. It's not a 100%. So, so it's, it's helpful, but it's not diagnostic. The sensitivity means that if it's positive that you have IBM. Well, I just told you that a proportion of patients with lupus, with other autoimmune diseases, can have a positive NCT51A antibody. So nobody should be getting that test alone and saying that they have IBM, okay? IBM is a clinical diagnosis that's also made with muscle biopsy. And I think that's what you heard up there. It wasn't that people aren't saying that someday we may understand this test better. But as of today, no one is going to rely on the antibody as being positive. It's fantastic that people are using that test. I love hearing that people are using that test because that's only going to inform us more and more. So we run that test on every patient with IBM. We run that test in our clinical lab on everybody that comes through the neuromuscle clinic because uh, we don't charge them for it, but we run it because we're interested in just seeing how good this test is. And I think, uh, I think someday it may, it may change. Now, 
Um, what else could that test be good for? So let's say that, that someday we, let's say if, if we have enough patients that, that all of a sudden we find out that 10 years prior to the onset of weakness, that an NCT 5-1A antibody could be positive and could predict, maybe not perfectly, but could predict patients that might have IBM in the future. So that's how we need to be thinking about this test. I, I realize that's not, hey, how's it going to affect me? But it's more, how's it going to affect the therapy? The other thing we can think about is, so, so what if we develop a therapy for IBM and that NCT 5-1A antibody goes away with you in you but but that that wouldn't in my mind that, that wouldn't make a difference what would make a difference is if the therapy made you stronger and the nct 5 one a antibody went away then that would suggest to me that maybe i can use this test to follow disease uh, progression or tr response to treatment so so that's where the promises of that of that uh, antibody is yes ma'am uh, um, i apologize because i came in a few minutes late I think I heard you say that it also is in lupus. Did you say that? And other autoimmune. So, so um, does, is there, and I have no medical background, is there a sense why people have antibodies? Does that make sense even as a question? Yeah, so, so, so we don't know why people have autoantibodies. We don't know that. It, it, it suggests that there's something going on with the immune system, but we don't know exactly why. And, and the immune system could be triggered by the environment or a virus or is... Yeah, right. So, so you guys have, have all met other people with IBM, right? And, I can't figure out any commonalities among you guys, and I bet you guys have talked with each other and can't figure out real commonalities. You may find a commonality with one or two people, um, but let me tell you, the, the, the commonalities are that you're older, you're over the age of 45. No. You're, you're, There's two of us in here who are older. I'm 43 and, I was th and I've had eight to 10 years. So, so that, make, that would make me, so, so some people ask, well, when do you want to revisit a diagnosis? That would make me rethink your diagnosis. Um, I, don't, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't have your records in front of me. I haven't examined you. I can't say for sure. But that makes me scratch my head, okay? It's very uncommon. So, so, so the other thing is that you guys have to realize is you guys are not, normal IBM patients. Do you know why you're not IB normal IBM patients? Because you came to this conference, okay? So you guys are, you know, motivated. You're just not, you know, this is, you're not the IBM patients that I see in my clinic, okay? You're motivated, you're, you're you know, you're, you're educated, you're here, okay? And so, and, and potentially you're biased towards younger patients. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so. Correct. And I know that uh, I see Dr. Bissler in Eastern Health in Houston, and, and she's like, your biopsy definitely shows IBM, but she's, she's also seeing uh, half of a genetic marker for um, another muscular dystrophy. So she's running down things. And I know that she's taken my case, because it's been so bizarre to her, to three or four conferences that you neurologists go to, just for neurologists. So, and she's running, she's run all the tests that I've ever heard of or she's found out about and even learned about new ones. So. Right. I, there may be different subsets of IBM. I don't, I don't, yeah. I, I think that's what we need to, to think about. But, right. but typically, right. So there are exceptions to every rule, okay? And so um, to, to, to ask about what's in the environment or what virus um, there are exceptions to every rule, and if it was, if it was simple that there was a, a commonality, so I'm going to tell you, okay, and we can, we can point out all the outliers in the room, okay, but the things that we know that cause risk for IBM is age, okay, 
The other things we know that cause risk for IBM is there seems to be a predilection toward men. And that's it, okay? Uh, men, men, all right? More men have IBM than women. That's all we know as far as risk. So if someone asks me, what's your risk? Let's see, somebody who's you know, 20 years old comes up to me and says, what's, your, what's my risk of having IBM? I'd say, these are the two things. If you're male, you have a higher risk. And if you're, but that's it. That's as good as we can get, okay? The other thing I wanted, I know I thought a number of years ago, I thought the NIH, I know there was a gathering of, um, of information about people's histories that was supposed to be all pulled together. And I'm assuming that the work on that should have been done and there's been no results delivered. My husband filled that out. Um, right, so, so the, what are the possibilities? So the possibilities are they didn't do anything with it. It's one possible. But the other possibility is that it, there wasn't any correlation, that there wasn't anything that they could find, and that's my guess. I th there's no, you know, uh, if, if there was a, it, no one's hiding things from anybody. There's no, no there's no magic. Yeah connection, and my guess is that they just didn't find any associations. Um, and, and, and I think that's true in what we see in clinical practice, and I think that's true in what we see in this room here. Um, and, and, and so th there's just no clear um, connections. We're starting to see some connections with, with uh, people who have previously had uh, in, uh, uh, viral infections to um, hepatitis C. Um, we're starting to see a connection in people who have HIV, but that doesn't mean every patient with HIV gets IBM. It just helps us think about the mechanism, so. Sporadic. Um, thank you. Sporadic IBM. Does that mean some days I can leap over a building in a single bound and the next day I'm just worthless? Is that what that implies? So, so, so sporadic means that there's no family history. Um, and so that's, that's what we call it sporadic. There are other forms of muscular dystrophies as well as inclusion body myopathies that are hereditary. And so it's to distinguish between hereditary and sporadic. It, it's a, it's an, uh, not the right term to use because um, there likely is a hereditary component to IBM. And so what you need to think about, so this is a field, so I mentioned this, when was IBM actually identified? Like when was it even called IBM? Do you guys even know that 1979, okay, 1979, okay? This disease hasn't been around that long, okay? And in 1979, it was identified and called sporadic IBM in three, three patients. One of those patients nowadays we wouldn't have said had IBM, okay? So, so, um, so, so I mean, th that's, the, that's the issue that we're, that we're dealing with. So we're using archaic language like sporadic IBM, and, and I don't think that we should get as hung up on what we're, what we're calling it. I know that's so important. You want to know what it is and, and all of that, but, but, um, but, but I think, you know, people, there are exceptions to every rule. My, you know, my sense is someone in here, if I said, oh, it means that you don't have a, uh, a family history, you'd say, oh, but he has a family history over here, he, you know. And so I, I, I hesitate to make these dogmatic statements. Um, this is the best we can work with uh, uh, today. Let me get a mic over there to you. And the, and the reason for it, we can hear you, but because we're taping this or it's live stream, so. I just wondered if, um because I've had a muscle biopsy, actually I've had two, and I wonder if there, when you look under the microscope at the cells in the biopsy, is it definitively like they have the vacuoles that it's IBM once they see it? Right. 
So, so, um, so muscle biopsies um, uh, are not perfect. So we just talked about another test that wasn't perfect, which was the NCT51A antibody. And so there's a lot that goes into a muscle biopsy. Um, you need to biopsy the right muscle, okay? And, and so the muscle needs to be uh, affected. And the way that, that we diagnose the muscle biopsy or just diagnose who's going to not diagnose, decide, is by examining the patient and perhaps doing uh, the EMG and picking the muscle that we see is affected. So often patients will get a muscle biopsy before they come and see me at a, at a tertiary care center. It will be done by somebody who, who doesn't think about the issues of a, of a muscle biopsy. And then, uh, and, and it won't show anything, or it won't show all the features. And then, and then we'll say, well, we need to potentially repeat it. That's one of the reasons that it needs to be repeated. The other is, is that um, it's, it's looking at it, and the person that's looking at it needs to also be familiar with IBM and myositis, okay? So if it's not being, so whenever someone sees me, I say, well, we need to get your muscle biopsy tissue and send it to us and then we need to actually look at it. And so um, just because, it, so it's in the eye of the beholder as well, it's what they're looking at. So I don't know for sure. So, so, so not having the features on the muscle biopsy could mean that they're not there. That's quite possible. But it could also mean that, um, that it wasn't the right muscle, that the person looking at it overlooked it, um, the person looking at it wasn't thinking about it, the other thing we've started to do is there's, there's, there's more features we can look at on the muscle biopsy that community places don't, don't do. And so we, um, we, uh, we, we, we do different stains and things like that um, to help look and see if that can help. So those are other things to do. Um, the, the other feature is the processing of the muscle biopsy. And so, so I have patients that come and see me from four hours away um, and, and, and see me in St. Louis, and, and I say, you know, we're going to do some tests, and we may need to do a muscle biopsy, and I want you to have the muscle biopsy done back here. I know it's inconvenient. I know it's four hours away, but let me tell you the other option. The other option is that you get the muscle biopsy done four hours away, and guess what happens? They're going to stick it in the mail, and they're going to mail it to me, and then I get to look at it, and, and guess what? you know, the, the mailman, the FedEx guy, isn't going to make it as pristine and perfect. And so that's another problem that can happen is that, and so I, whenever patients argue about, I don't want to come again, I'm, I, I really, there's reasons. We don't, we're not doing things to make your life difficult. We're just, we're not. Um, we want to make sure you get the best diagnosis uh, possible. Does that answer your question? She had to consult her team first, and so I knew it wasn't. I knew she was looking at a physical exam, a combination of things. So I just wondered if it was something you could actually see. So lots of variables. Yes. Are there any predictors maybe in the biopsy that predict a patient's course of the disease in terms of maybe how fast it might progress or what they might look like over time? Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a great question. So are there, and so um, the answer is, the short answer is no. Um, th the long answer is I, I think there could be and we just need to, to figure it out. And so that's, that's a question of, um, so whenever we start thinking about IBM, um, what, what, and you guys are awesome at this, what would you want to know the day that you got the diagnosis? You'd want to know how you were going to progress. So you'd want to know prognosis, okay? You'd want to know, um, you know, that, that's, that's something very important. So that's a prognostic biomarker is what you want to know. And so the way, how do we do that? Well, um, in a rare disease, it can be very difficult to do. So uh, in a rare disease where there's only a handful and hundreds is a handful, I don't, I don't know 
Exactly. The other thing it takes is, is um, so let's say I do a biopsy on somebody. So, so there's, there's something called natural history studies, okay? And so, so um, a natural history study is, um, you know, we all, we all think that, that, that we know how IBM is progressing, okay? But we don't really know how IBM is progressing in a whole group of patients. And, and because we don't know how it's progressing in a whole group of patients, it becomes very difficult to then do the things that you're asking, which is, well, if we knew that over the course of five years, so that would require every patient with IBM coming to see the same person, having the same type of exams, and correlating them over the course of a year, two years, three years, four years, five years, obviously the longer, the better, okay? It would mean making sure that everybody with IBM that was in that trial had the same initial tests. Everyone had the same biopsy, done the right way, um, and, and done, done properly. And, and then, and then the, the reason that's important is also because of a clinical trial. And so whenever we do a clinical trial, um, m many times the goal of a clinical trial is to slow disease progression. And if, if, the, if the natural history of, of IBM, if what we, uh, what we think is the natural history of IBM is that people lose, you know, I'm just going to pick some numbers, not, I'm, I don't want you to hold me to them, um, is that over the course of a year, someone will lose 10% of their strength. I don't think that's true, but I'm just giving you an example. Let's say that someone thinks that, and then they design a clinical trial, okay, to look, and the, and the goal is, is that patients should get, not lose 10% of their strength, okay? But let's say that, that we got that wrong, and actually over the course of a year, patients really only lose 3% of their strength. Well, now this trial, which was really not to make, not, not powered to improve strength, but was powered to change the course of natural history, now my deviation is only 3% because I didn't know the natural history of the disease ahead of time. And so th that's, that's where um, there is some, uh, it, it is important to do these types of, of natural history studies. And I think that um, uh, it, it may sound like we're not thinking about treatment and we're not thinking about um, underlying mechanism of disease, but we're really trying to just understand the natural history of the disease. Because what's the worst thing, in my mind, one of the worst things that could happen is that, you know, we have these small <clears throat> trials where, where three people get a drug and they get amazingly better, and then all of a sudden we do a real placebo-controlled trial and it doesn't work. And that's, that would be very, that would be a disaster. That would be frustrating. And so it's really figuring out how to do these things correctly. But, um, but yeah, your, your initial question was, are there features on the muscle biopsy that can predict uh, disease, um, you know, as far as how long it's uh, progressing and things like that, and there just isn't. A couple of comments. You asked what uh, we'd want if we were, you know, when we were diagnosed with IBM, the lottery numbers <laughs> to pay for all the stuff we're going to need. Um, do you, oh, and you are going to take an electro torture test and let that's, us know. That's right, I committed to that yesterday. Yes. That's right. I'll come down and that's I'm right. a medic, I'll, I'll do it. Okay. We'll wiggle those needles around that's a whole right. bunch and find the real sensor. That's right. Spots. I shouldn't have admitted that I have never had one. Oh, so. uh, we, we remember it. Right. Um, are you using. <laughs> Are you using MRI at all on the T for the water to find where to do the bio? I have not actually been diagnosed yet. I yeah. cannot find a doctor to do it. I've gone 15 different doctors. Most don't even know what IBM are, and the others don't care. Uh, I've been diagnosed with everything from rheumatoid arthritis, which I don't have. I have psoriatic arthritis. I've had you know tons of various different diagnoses, and I've given up. Um, I'm going to talk to you, though. Okay. So I may just you know, fly from Canada to here just to get it done. Um, are you using MRI at all to try and find yeah. that muscle? So, so um, we, we do use MRI sometimes. Um, uh, well, it, it, in the scheme of things, it, the in the scheme of things, it's not. Um, it actually brings up two issues. So, so why would we, why would someone need an, an MRI of their muscles? So what, what, 
what information are we going to get? Um, so, um, so often it can help us identify muscles that are, that are weak. Um, and, and I shouldn't say muscles that are weak, muscles that are affected. So it can increase the yield of the biopsy, okay? So um, all we're thinking about is how can we increase the, you know, biopsies, we don't take it lightly. And, um, and so if it's being done, we wanna make sure we get the most information possible from it. So an MRI can help, help with that. Um, you know, the other things we do to help is to look and see which muscles are weak and we look to, to stick a needle in and see which muscles are affected or things like that. So often we don't need a muscle biopsy, or not a muscle biopsy, often we don't need an MRI to, to help with that. The times we use an MRI is whenever we're confused or, or, or can't figure out where the best muscle would be. Unfortunately, sometimes we use the MRI after the first muscle biopsy is non-diagnostic, and then we say, well, we weren't as smart as we thought we were, and we, we revisit it. So, so um, you know, Full disclosure, yeah. Why, I mean, I, I've operated a Phillips, you know, electron microscope, and I'm a scientist, and, um, you know, you're using a little tiny sample. I've seen people with five-inch, you know, cuts on their leg from, you know, a yeah. biopsy. They took literally chunks of metal, you know, muscle out of there. You only need a tiny, tiny little bit. Why are the biopsies so huge? I mean, you know, in... Other biopsies, they, they'll use a, you know, a needle and, and pull it yeah. out. So, so it's a patchy disease. You guys have probably heard that. So it's a patchy disease. It affects not only some muscles, um, and it doesn't affect other muscles. And even within the same muscle tissue, it, you can have a region that shows pathology and a region that doesn't show pathology. And so um, you know, I don't advocate taking a large chunk, but I do advocate an open biopsy. And the reason is because um, I, I want to make sure that we get information. And, and I don't want you to get a needle biopsy and have it come back and it's all connective tissue because they couldn't visualize where they were going in. So a needle biopsy is, 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 is really, you know, it's a blind needle biopsy. They're just sticking in the needle and they're hoping that they're going to get muscle. And often they do. And, 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 it's, and it's very helpful. But if I have a patient that's going through the biopsy, I want to make sure we get the tissue that's going to be informative. So, so I am uh, one of the meaner neurologists that would want an open biopsy. But that's the reason. Um, you know, it's, it's not to torture you. It's to, it's, it's to, um, to, to, to do it right. Yeah, so, so I mean, so we, we, so we get the, the tissue out, so I don't know, um, I can, I'm happy to explain. So we take out a t piece of tissue, um, we then mount it, and then we freeze it, and everything's done on fresh, frozen tissue. So like I said, if you have this done uh, at your community hospital, they need to send it on gauze, fresh, f you know, overnight to us, which is not ideal, as I said. Um, it's not like it's fixed and embedded by, um, by that hospital. It needs to be processed by, by us. And so um, we then mount it, and then we take, um, we, we look at 17 different stains initially, and then we may do other stains as well. You have to slice it first. We section it. Cross-section. Right. So we're only looking at one region of it. But, but um, if, if, if you're my patient, and, and I have sat down and talked with you and examined you and think that you could have IBM, and I don't see it on the muscle biopsy, we would go back and recut the same thing again and again and again until we, till we, till we could make sure that we'd exhausted that piece of tissue. So, um, you know, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. We don't use a whole lot of it. You're absolutely right. Yes, ma'am. Um, in regards to the EMG tests, uh, the ones where yeah. they stick the needle in your muscle and you yell, is yeah. scream. <laughs> the first time I had it done was in 2006, and I didn't know that the, it would hurt at all. And um, um, the Scripps doctor, uh, after 
doing a biopsy told me I had IBM, but he didn't see any of those vacuoles or what do you call them. But um, I was wondering how come I had this electro test, the needles, done again uh, by another doctor, and it was so painful. It was like three, four, four years later, and my muscles were so painful when he put those needles in and the electrodes that I just, he had to stop in the middle of the test. And that happened again six months later. He had to stop in the middle of the test because I was too full of pain to keep on. And USC did the same thing. And I was, they stopped in the middle. How come? I, I'm just, I, I want to make sure I answer, the, is the question why you had pain with it? Yeah, yeah that I, I don't know the answer. Some people uh, have harder time tolerating that, that test. Right. I was still walking around and jumping and stuff. Yeah, I don't know the, I don't have an answer for you. I didn't lift my head yeah, I think everyone has their own experience with it. <laughs> um, is anybody looking, because I mean, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence out there about the gut and the gut being, you know, the primary thing for your autoimmune um, problems. Is anybody looking at that? Is anybody looking at I know pot's a big thing in the country now, and um, I've had a rheumatologist tell me, off the record, yes, I see patients do better with the inflammation, and that makes them stronger, but it doesn't cure anything. They have to continue to smoke, you know. And also, I'm one of these people who's had that like, EMG test twice. It didn't bother me a bit. What killed me was the biopsy. So, um, so. I'm, I'm, I want to make sure I answer both your questions. So, um, is there is there a connection between the the gut and and yeah? So so there clearly is a connection between the gut, and so we heard a little bit about it about the um, your microbiome. So your microbiome is is actually the organisms that live in my intestines are different than the organisms that live in other people's intestines. Um, and so um, there is lots of, of data coming out that certain autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis um, or, or other autoimmune diseases like we heard scleroderma, that, that the microbiome in those people's guts is different and, and potentially is that explaining why they might be um, uh, triggering autoimmune type disorders becomes very complicated because we give you then drugs um, that likely also change the gut microbiome. So it's, it's not, it's not a, a trivial thing to start thinking about. You know, I think that, um, that the gut microbiome studies is, is fascinating and diagnostically, if we could take a stool sample from somebody and, and understand what they were at risk for or dictate therapy, um, that would be fantastic. We're not, we're not there yet. Um, but I think it's, it's exciting. And, and as you heard, um, so it's, it's not called a poo pill. It's actually, it's called a fecal transplant, okay, is the fancier term, okay. But, uh, but those things are absolutely being thought of for autoimmune type diseases. Um, I don't know of anyone doing it in, in IBM, and, um, and um, you know, it, it'll take some time. As far as, um, you know, other types of, of drugs, so, so one thing, um, and, and actually my patient, Mrs. Weimer's here, so, so one thing that we're not good about, and I, maybe it's just me, is, uh, is non-Western-based medicine, okay? So, um, Okay, right. So, so one of uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I saw that actually. Augie's going to talk about like a tens unit in IBM, and aren't you going to talk about something? Not tens, but it's electrical stimulation. 
So electrical stimulation. So I, 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 those are those are things that that you guys educate me about. You know, massage therapy, marijuana use. I don't know, you know, if any of that's good. L Linda Weimers will call me and say, "What do you think about this?" or "What do you think about this?" And and um, you, I don't know if she appreciates my answers half the time. But we can ask. We can ask her. Whenever I say I don't know or I don't believe. Yeah. Her, I just There's want no evidence for right. It. Yeah, it's disappointing. Yeah, it's disappointing. <laughs> so I apologize. Yeah, for that, but, um, yeah. But I, I just don't. I, you know, it's um, Western medicine is evidence-based medicine, and I don't want to tell you what I don't know. And um, you know, anecdotal, um, you know, Eastern cultured medicine of acupuncture and, and all of that. My advice is if you do it and it works for you then awesome then do it if it's if you're doing it and someone's telling you this is the cure be a little skeptical okay because i tell you if the cure was out there i'm not hiding it so when patients come and say how come you didn't tell me about doing you know this type of, of treatment it, it, I, well, I'm not hiding anything from you, you know, it's, it's, so it's, I think it's just being, the, oh, my, on the, my third comment about, about uh, alternative therapies um, is that I also don't want you to break the bank with them, okay? And, um, and you guys have lots of other things that are important to spend money on than something that we don't know if it's going to work or not. Um, so, so that would just kind of be my, my comments. I wanted to see, uh, several years ago, you came to one of our conferences and collected a lot of samples uh, from us for some DNA uh, studies. And I was wondering if anything, and we never heard anything more about that. Has anything uh, resulted from that? Yeah. So, so, so there, there was a paper published where we did, we, we did um, identify, uh, so, so what we did, so we had a thought, and I'm actually going to have, there's a session later that I'm going to talk about genetics and IBM. But, but no one, so, so it, had, it had bothered me that, that everyone was calling this sporadic IBM, okay? And in fact, in the diagnosis, diagnostic criteria for IBM, it says you cannot have a family history of weakness, okay? Well, there's lots of people that have a family history of weakness or a family history of other uh, autoimmune disorders. So we wanted to see if there was a uh, genetic uh, underpinning of IBM. And so um, we, we performed a, a study, and, and um, Augie's right, we went and um, I brought a group of people out. We did it actually twice. We did it at St. Louis, and then we did it again at the Louisville, Kentucky um, meeting. And then we also collected patients in our, in our clinic. And we did uh, sequencing of, of certain, certain uh, genes. And what we found um, is that uh, so we, we performed, uh, so there's different ways to do different sequencing strategies. And whenever I say sequencing strategy, I'm talking about looking for different mutations and different genes. And so for the first approach, what we did is we said, well, let's look at known genes that have been reported to cause things that look like IBM um, and see if those are present in our, in our patient population. And so we did find that, that in our group of 79 patients with sporadic IBM, that two of those patients who, by all diagnostic criteria, should have had sporadic IBM, actually had uh, uh, mutations that have been associated with hereditary forms, okay? And just to let Augie know and anyone who did provide samples, if you were one of those patients, we absolutely went and told you and talked about it, okay? So I don't want you to think that, that we hid anything from anybody. Whenever we do a, a research study, so we, we may have, have sequenced uh, somebody's, somebody's DNA um, and, and we have the results, but we, we have actionable items that we would have to then report back. And so those were, that was absolutely done. Um, so, so, so that was that, what does that say? What does that mean? So that means that, um, that some patients with sporadic IBM may have uh, 
hereditary causes of IBM, the implications would be that potentially you could pass that on to your family members. The implications would be that you didn't really have IBM. And so that's something I think everyone, everyone says, everyone wants to know what they have. And now I just said, well, I'm going to make it even more complicated. So, so that's not the goal. It doesn't mean you don't have what you have, but it means that, that you have a, a potentially an IBM that, that could be hereditary. So, so, so the issue then is also is if we do this, this natural history study, you know, if we look and want to understand how a patient progresses, and of the 79, two of them don't actually have what everyone else has, now, and, and so the reason it's important is for clinical trials and, and, and things like that. Um, to be quite honest, I got a lot of grief from that paper. And the reason I got a lot of grief from that paper was I was told, well, you just got it wrong whenever you saw those patients. Um, and so um, th that's, that's, that's it, whenever I sh shared that paper, people said, well, you should have known when you saw that patient that they had a hereditary form. And, and the point of the paper was to say, hey, even at, even at, a, at a, 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 the Myositis Association where we collected patients, they, they don't all have what they, what they think they have. So, and so, so to tell you to dovetail a little bit further, so we've done further now more unbiased studies. And so that paper's um, in review. And so I, I, I can mention to Bob, I don't know how he puts out information uh, for, um, you know, that the research team has done, but. Um, yeah, because I had sent them a synopsis, a lay synopsis about that paper and, and you know, I did my part. <laughs> sure. Yes. Uh, in regards to uh, age and the typical onset, um, being 50 and over, um, is that like you don't really understand how it progresses or what causes it? Is that really something that you can definitively say that it's only people that are over 50? Um, and Or is it something where, because it's just becoming more recognized, that um, people are just that are older are just getting their diagnosis because it wasn't available before, and so then the, like the demographic then will become lower, and people like in our situation will have better opportunities for treatment and diagnosis. Yeah. So so I think that raises a, a great question. So so um, classically, the uh, the the patients you know, older than 45 have, have, uh, have IBM, and actually it's been proposed to be in the diagnostic criteria, and some diagnostic criteria push it down to 35. Um, and so it may be that you're right, that as awareness increases that will identify this sooner and sooner. It may also be that people will have NCT518A antibody testing whenever they're 35 or 20 with weakness, and it'll be positive and we'll say that they have, have IBM. And, and so it's, it's possible that that's happening. I think um, I would, um, I would if, if a patient of mine, who if he was younger than, than uh, 50 or 45, I would push really hard to try and understand um, what was going on. Um, and so um, I, I think that um, it's, it's possible that a, a younger person can get IBM, but I would I would push hard to try to, to understand if that really is what we think of as sporadic inclusion body myositis that happens as we get as we get older. Now that physical therapy, I mean, excuse me. Now that exercise has been uh, highly suggested, that we do with IBM. Um, you're going to find three things that most of us are going to ask ourselves. One, how do I do it when I have to suffer from chronic uh, exhaustion? Two, can I do it safely? And three, can I make it habit? And I turn to uh, going to a physical therapist. Now, the challenge is finding a physical therapist that's not going to treat you like everybody else. Uh, my, uh, mine's more of a request. Uh, my request 
to the advisory board and, and to the medical field and research is that we need uh, we need some type of video that maybe we, we could take to a physical therapist and say, hey, this is what I have, and, and directed to the medical field or the physical therapist, uh, this is the symptoms, this is suggestions from the myositis association, how you should move forward with this person. Because not, you know, there's three type of our myositis, our needs are all different, our stages are all different. What we don't want to happen is they're trying to treat us all the same as normals or all the same as the same level of IBM or the same level of DM um, because uh, that's how I, I thank physical therapy and exercise for being more mobile today than I was two years ago. And so to me, exercise works, but the key is to do it safely, to do it slowly, and to do it within your restraints. And the best way for me was to get to a professional and go through the process. So I, what I see is a lot of people leaving from conference and going, hey, I need a physical therapist. But then we open up a whole can of worms, which then we're going to people that aren't educated on our disease. Right. So I, I think you're... Can you pass on the need of research? We need some type of video to help educate that we can get from the CMA and say, uh, this is my disease. Can you do anything for me? Right. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, that, I, well, we can pass it on. Yeah, absolutely. I think physical therapy, um, it is, um, this is what I tell my patients, is if, is if they go to a physical therapist and that physical therapist uh, doesn't want to learn, doesn't want to hear, doesn't want, doesn't understand, um, and it, 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 it's not the right fit, and, and, um, and it may take some time. And you know, you guys need to to advocate. Um, you know, you're not. You, you may feel like you're being difficult, but you're not. You're just advocating for yourself. So, what is a physical therapist most used to seeing? They're most used to seeing somebody who's had a stroke or some type of injury. And guess what they want to see happen? Guess how they feel good? Is if you get stronger. And and they don't they don't think as much about well, actually, he's, he's getting around better than he was, or, or things like that. that. That problem permeates even further than the physical therapist. That problem permeates even to payers, because if you're not continuing to improve, the insurance company says, well, you don't need physical therapy anymore. So it's a problem. We know about it, and, um, and I don't have a, a, a clear answer for it. But, but I would suggest that, um, that you know, be open and, and, and insist upon uh, a physical therapist. Because, you know, to, to try and find a physical therapist that specializes in myositis, I think that's a, that's, that's, that's a lofty goal throughout the entire U.S. I think trying to find a therapist that's open and wants to learn and listen to you, that, that I think we can do. That, that I think is possible. Um, and so that's what I would suggest. I just want to pass on how it went with my, me and my physical therapist. I contacted him, told him I had IBM, asked him over the phone, is there anything, can you treat me? He said, come on in, come on in let's talk. We sat in his office. He did some uh, hand movements, some muscle tests, you know, feeling. And then he, and I suggested, let's go on uh, mysatis.org. And so he popped it on, and he went through the thing, and he goes, why don't you go ride on the bike out there for five minutes, put it at the easiest session. He sat over there, he went through the whole process, brought me back in, and we talked about what is it I wanted. You know, I wanted to get out of the chair, I wanted to go up the stairs, I wanted to open a jar. And so he said, well, I'm gonna send you home, let me call you in a couple of weeks, let me see if I can work up a program. And the understanding wasn't to get stronger, the understanding was to keep functional and mobile. And it worked out well because I've had 95 sessions with them. So, so I, can, I can only imagine it's frustrating to go to a physical therapist and say, I have IBM, and for the first words out of their mouth to say, I don't know what that is. But it's, I'm sure it's frustrating. But I mean, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt that they're going to want to learn about it and that you're not going to have the answer the first time you go see them, that it's a journey, and that maybe it's going to take two months 
to be like, actually, this guy doesn't really listening to me. He's not doing what I want. And so I, I can imagine this is something. So, so one thing we know about IBM is you're going to have it. And you're going to have it for the rest of your life. And, um, and so you're not going to, you know, people don't, uh, the lifespan of a patient with IBM is, is the same as other people. We know that. And so, you know, my, my goals for patients on some levels is to think about how they're going to be in 10 years. And if it takes six months of investment in a physical therapist um, that, th to find out if he's the right person so that you can have functionality for the next 10, 15 years, I mean, that's, that's the way I would try to think about it. I know it's frustrating. I can't even imagine the frustration that, that, it, that you feel. And, um, and, and I'm sure I'm oversimplifying it, but, but um, okay, this guy was here too, sorry. Uh, a couple of years ago, they told me I shouldn't exercise because exercising will wear ultra muscles and you won't develop any new ones. Now they're saying mild exercise would be beneficial. My question is, a low dose of steroids, I know muscle builders and athletes have been using a lot of steroids to build their muscles. Would a low dose of steroids be helpful in building more muscle mass? Right. So, so one thing to, to clarify is the steroids like prednisone are different than the steroids that we hear about in competitive athletes. So those are, those, that's different. Those are anabolic steroids. Um, you know, we, we have, we've had trials throughout uh, the years, and not recently, but, but in the past that have looked at using anabolic steroids in muscle diseases, and they haven't panned out as, as helping, as being beneficial. Um, so so I, I, I don't think that's going to end up being the, the answer. I think exercise is, is different. And, and exercise, I think we need to think about what exercise does. So exercise doesn't just, um, whenever someone exercises, they're not just building muscle mass. They're actually reprogramming their muscle to build up more mitochondria. They're increasing capillary growth. They're bringing oxygen to the muscle. And so exercise is doing a lot more than just increasing muscle mass. I think, um, I think so, so the, the ways that people used to think about exercise was that you were causing more damage than good. And I think it's now appreciated that you're probably doing more, more help by doing exercise. Um, I think the exercise that, that um, so this is my personal bias, and I'm, and I'm going to fully disclose this is my personal bias. So, so, so I often will say to a patient, you need to exercise. And they'll say, well, I go out in the garden, and I do this, and I do that, and I'm really active. And I really think, I've come to believe that there is something very different about intentional 30 minutes a day of exercise three times a week that, you know, you can continue to go work out in the garden, but I don't think that we should try to convince ourselves that that counts as your exercise. I think we need to have intentional exercise. And, um, and, and, and so I just, I, I, I say that um, because I think it's, um, uh, I, I think it's important in the re and I'm able to say that with some clarity because of the studies that have been done that have actually looked at intentional exercise 30 minutes three times a day, or three times a week. I, I didn't mean three times a day. <laughs> three times a week, sorry. <laughs> okay, this. So I've had uh, a not so good experience with physical therapy and a good one, and then a class that is turned out to be the best. <clears throat> when I first signed up for uh, aquatic therapy, um, I went out to the TMA website, and it was maybe four years ago. You can find it out there. There's a set of notes that uh, two physical therapists out of the, I believe, Barrow Institute in, in Phoenix put out there, and, and I sent it as an email message to the physical therapist, because I said IBM, and he said, what? Um, and, 
and, and it's one thing to, to give them the information, it's the other thing is to get them to read it and understand it. And I, and I never felt that, um, that, he, that he did. And uh, no matter how, how much I tried, I said, you know, I, I need to transition to land, I need to do this, I need to do that, but it was easier to stick him on a treadmill, have him lift his legs and his arms when he's inside the, in the pool. So eventually, I maxed out for the reason you said, he's not making any progress. And fortunately, somebody in the, in the insurance company figured out that I was out of network, and that's why they were giving me such a hard time. I got switched to in-network, I sent the, the same file that I had sent to the first one, and this physical therapist, she read it, she understood it, and she actually applied it on me to where I was doing physical activities, and she was increasing like the little things that they put on your arms and, and your legs. We moved. We moved from Texas to um, Louisiana, and I'm in a small town, 20,000 people, right? We joined a health uh, club, and they had a class 8.30 in the morning. I'm a night owl. 8.30 in the morning, three days a week, called Arthritis Water. And it's 50 minutes long, so I'm, I'm doing your three, three times a week, 50 minutes long, and it is a combination of cardio to get the heart rate up and uh, strength, muscle strength. And, and you would think three days a week doing the same thing inside the pool, it gets boring. Nope, we have maybe five different teachers. Two of them are regulars, and so we get substitutes. They each have their own style. They do music. I never danced when I did exercises. But, but to be there in the community and, and learn from other folks what works for them and what doesn't, uh, it's been great. One more quick story. So I keep hearing negative comments about the EMG studies. I've had three. Um, the first two were sort of so-so. The third one, I had so much fun. Uh, it was at a teaching hospital, so you know what that means. The specialist has residents in there. And he had one resident, and he said to the resident, I'm going to do the following to him. What do you expect is the result? And the resident said, blah, 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 blah. It's going to be this. He said, no, it's not. It's going to be the complete opposite of what you think it is. And the resident's going, no, no, that's not what I was taught. And he goes, watch. And sure enough, the result came out the complete opposite of what the resident expected. The neurologist said, you owe me and him $500. <laughs> no, he said, I'm a poor resident. I don't have much money. <laughs> so I said, we take IOUs. <laughs> I think we got one back here. My name's Rick. Um, this disease attacks muscles, obviously, as we've said. Our heart is a muscle. Is there any chance that our heart could be damaged from this? Yeah, so, so there's, there's, um, there's no clear evidence. There are exceptions to the rule. Uh, there's a study that came out that showed a patient with uh, cardiac issues with IBM. It's not something that is typical. Um, so I, I don't usually, um, you know, I, I don't usually think of it as attacking uh, the heart. This is kind of a follow-up to that. Um, we know that the uh, IBM originates, uh, the first symptoms show up in our quadriceps, our finger flexors, and the anterior tip. And um, so that gives us the clues of what the disease is. And then it will eventually spread, right? Um, and because we end up with, uh, all, many of us will end up with dysphagia, and so that, that weakness is caused by, by the IBM. In your experience, will the IBM eventually affect all the different muscles in our, in our body, the skeletal muscles well, I'm talking about right now? Yes, yeah, so, so, so as far as, as we know, um, so, so, so uh, I, I don't want to say all the muscles because um, uh, patients don't usually develop eye movement problems. Um, the sphincter control, we, we don't usually lose, lose that. So I don't want to say all the muscles, but, but in theory, yes, 
many of, of the muscles will be affected. Are there some that are spared? Or if, if you were to, um, uh, you know, live past, past your lifespan, would they be affected? I don't know the answer to that. But there's no, no evidence that, um, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna affect your, your heart. Your heart's a very different type of muscle. Excuse me. Um, I'm sure there could be a really long discussion, but on, on how, so IBM is still a mystery, and there's only so much research being done but you have mentioned some things where the pathology is similar to other disorders. So two that have come up today would be some forms of leukemia and then lupus, at least sharing an antibody. Um, uh, in your view, which of those things, th there's probably much more research being d done in some of those uh, conditions with similar pathology. How, which of those do you think might be likely to unearth something that will be useful on IBM. And, and if I had to narrow the question down for today, it would be, how are you gonna learn about that? Are these umbrella organizations that talk about rare disorders or autoimmune disorders, are they effective in getting knowledge and discovery transferred amongst you practitioners? Or I, I get a, a little bit of a fear that there's enough silos that um, someone working in lupus will find what looks like a modest discovery, but it'd be super beneficial in IBM. How will that get to you? And are those, are those kinds of things effective in, trans, in getting knowledge transferred? Um, so I think, I think you're asking a couple of questions maybe, which is how do we, how do we communicate discoveries across disciplines? And, um, and, and that, that can be difficult to do. But there is a, a framework for it. There is the medical literature that does it. Um, there, are, there are ways to, to do that. Um, do I know everything that's going on in, uh, in lupus research? No, I don't. Um, and, and I don't know if, if, if that's the, the most uh, important thing to be, to be thinking about. I don't know the answer to that. What I will say about medical research is that um, when you ask what am I excited about? So you gave two examples. You gave one about an overlap with uh, autoimmune disorders, and you gave another example of a connection with a type of leukemia. So we, we have, for the past 20 years, focused on the autoimmune aspects of IBM. We have had clinical trials taking drugs that work in lupus and work in MS and tried them in IBM and they haven't worked. So what excites me most is something like what Steve Greenberg was saying, which is something new, novel, out of the box, no one else is thinking about. And those are the hardest things to get funded for research, is trying something new. Suggesting that there may be a genetic etiology or underpinning to, um, to, to IBM uh, it's been very hard to convince people. And in fact, I told you we published it and they said, well, that's just because you're not a good clinician. So I mean, it, you know, it's very hard to change dogma. So, so I would suggest that, that we want people that are thinking of new, novel uh, ways rather than, um, than, than me pushing hard on the same old stuff over and over. And so that's, that's what excites me, um, is anybody that's willing to, um, I don't know if yesterday I talked about, um, you know, how do you, uh, how do I know if my diagnosis is right? And I said, you know, every time someone comes in to the clinic, I rethink really about their diagnosis. And it's not because I'm uncertain, it's just because I like to rethink about things. And so I like to rethink about the IBM field, and I feel like people are starting to do that. And I think that's what we need to focus on because what's been work, what's been tried, isn't working. And so we really need to to try something something new. Um, and so so that's that's what I think. And to who funds that stuff? Um, so so medical research is principally funded by the NIH. Um, the NIH, in particular, for um, for myositis and for inclusion body myositis in particular, actually there's three different agencies in which fund that. 
but it's still a small fraction of, of the amount of, of NIH research that's being, being funded uh, toward IBM. Priorities for, um, for research are, are really um, the things that, that promote research is not the NIH doesn't say, hey, we want to fund IBM research. The NIH says, we want to fund good research. Okay? Sometimes they'll have some initiatives, so Alzheimer's disease may get an extra initiative, but for most diseases, they say we want to fund good research. And so how do we get more funding from the NIH? We build and grow people that are interested in myositis, young people, we train them to be interested in IBM so that they can make good research proposals, and that's where an organization like the TMA can, can help do that. Um, so that's really important. The other ways that we get funding are from advocacy organizations. So the Muscular Dystrophy Association, which does have an agenda of funding research that's in muscle disease. And so the Muscular Dystrophy Association, the issue is the MDA or Muscular Dystrophy Association funds a, a fraction of what the NIH will fund. And then the other organizations are organizations like the Myositis Association, um, which uh, is a smaller organization and funds even less than the MDA, but those are the, the main sources of, of funding. And then the other can come from, from philanthropy um, and, and those types of things, but, but principally it's via the NIH and the way that we get more NIH funding is by, by fostering good research and, and building up the, the good research. All right. Yeah, I, I just, and this might be a takeoff on Augie or the issue of doing biopsies and things, and I came in late again, but there is the clinical examination, and, you know, there are certain very definite things with IBM, the asymmetrical, the hands, the, you know, hearing, today I heard someone who wasn't sure about his diagnosis, but he was having a harder time getting out of a seat, he was having a harder time lifting things, coming down a ladder that certainly make flashing red lights for for IBM, so I, you know, because he said he had a mixed picture, was it Polly, but I'm, sure, I'm not a doctor, but my husband has IBM, so I've learned these kind of things when he goes for his examination, those are the kinds of things the doctor looks for. My husband was diagnosed at five years ago, but he can also think back 12 years when a physical trainer noticed one leg was thinner than the other and thought that was interesting. He wasn't falling at that time. So I think there's, it seems to me and from other people I know, that you hear these stories that maybe 10 years before they were diagnosed, they fell, but then they didn't fall again. So they do talk about, well, maybe I started having it earlier. So, so this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, which is um, age-associated muscle weakness. And so should you get weak, as you get older? Should you need a cane as you get older? Is that, is that the default? Is that normal? No, absolutely not. I don't care. If your grandparents used a cane, there was something wrong. They had something, they may not have had it diagnosed, but it wasn't normal, healthy aging. That's the default, normal, healthy aging. Do we, should we, should we all start having difficulty paying our bills as we get older? No. Should we accept that? No. So just like in the dementia field, if I start to lose my faculties, if I start to have difficulty with, with, um, with paying the bills, do I go and tell my spouse or do I try to keep quiet about it? 
Am I embarrassed that it's happening? Maybe. And so that's one front line is patience, is changing mindsets of the world. Because you're getting a little weaker and you can't do what you used to do, you can't bike ride as far, you're tripping. Do you keep that quiet? Because if you tell your wife you've admitted that there's something wrong with you, do you tell your kids who then all of a sudden think, oh my gosh, I don't got to take, no. We've got to change mindset. Now, that's one step. The other step is, is physicians, okay? So primary care physicians, okay? So they need to recognize, and, and I'm sure that many have said, you know, oh, that just happens as you get older. That's not true. And so they need to be ready to listen and work things up. So there is a screening test called the AD8, which is eight questions for Alzheimer's disease, which are high yield questions. And they're questions like, uh, do you pay the bills? Um, uh, they're, they're very functionally related questions. Do you, um, do you ever get lost going places? And, and, and it's a screening test that, that a primary care physician can give. And, and it doesn't mean that you have Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't mean you have Alzheimer's disease. It just means that, hey, maybe if you, if you test on this, that you should go see a neurologist who will do a formal test and, die, and, and look. The same thing needs to be developed for age-associated muscle weakness. A question like, do you have trouble getting out of the car? Do you have trouble getting up from uh, a chair? My favorite question is, do you no longer sit on the couch because it's too deep and you can't get up out of it? You know, those are, those are my personal favorite questions, but could we develop something like that that patients would all answer and that physicians would then and take that, that away? Because your primary care physician may not know the buzzwords to ask. Why is it important that we have a screening test? And I'm gonna take Alzheimer's disease as an example. Why is it important that we have a screening test for Alzheimer's disease? Why do we need to know that you're at risk of having dementia five years earlier than, than having it? It's because therapies are being developed that are only going to work if we treat people earlier. Now, that's going to be hard for patients to say, I have Alzheimer's disease, but I think just fine, and I'm going to take a medicine even though I think just fine. And I think the same problem is going to happen with age-associated muscle weakness is if we start diagnosing people with weakness earlier and earlier, even though they're able to do things, there's going to be stigma around it, just like there's stigma around having dementia. And so I would urge you as patients to you know, not let the stigma get around. And, and, um, and, and you know, I hope that someday that my kids won't believe that as you get older you get weak, because I just don't, that, if that's the belief that you have, then you're not gonna go to the doctor, because you just figured that's what happens. If that's the belief that your primary care doctor has, and you walk in and say, I'm feeling weak, and he says, that just happens when we get older, we're never going to move to the next step of, di of diagnosis. And so that's, that's what we need to do. We need to push the timeline of diagnosis um, back you know, by, by 10 years, if possible. Um, I spend a lot of time in a, an assisted living, um, um, independent living facility, because my mother-in-law is in one. And uh, probably 50, 60 percent of the people in that facility use uh, a walker or a cane or an electric scooter. I just assume that's part of normal uh, muscle aging. If, if you look at a, a person in their 80s or 90s who have uh, uh, very diminished muscle function, is their muscle different than the muscle from a person with, uh, who's in their 50s or 60s with IBM? So, uh, so are you saying if someone gets older and gets weak is... Yeah, I see a lot of people who yeah. so... So I do not want to convey that patients like you're describing in a nursing home with a scooter have IBM and are being misdiagnosed. I do not want to convey that at all. Is different. Is different. It's different. It's different. It's not IBM. It's different. 
It, but they could be, but my, my point would be not just for IBM. My point would be that, that uh, they're not just weak because they got old. You know, they're weak because of something that's, that's, you know, whether it's chronic medical issues that have taken over, you know, wh whatever. The, you know, the, my, my point is, is that, is that they're, they're not, that's not the default. Um, and, and, and we see that. We see older individuals that are ambulating all the time. So, yeah. Um, let me know if this is pa too patient specific, but um, going back to the age question, and you said that you would question um, what are some things that we can do. Um, our next step with his doctor is um, genetic testing. Um, is, are we going in the right direction, or is there other things that we should question? Yeah, so I, I would make sure, so I think everyone who's been told they have a diagnosis of IBM needs to go to a specialty tertiary care center. I, I don't think that you need to go to, to, to one of us necessarily, but you need to go to your nearest academic MDA center and see a physician that specializes in neuromuscular disease. So if, assuming that's been done, mm -hmm. then I think genetic testing is an appropriate next test okay. um, to, to move into that. I think it's always worth having a second opinion. And, um, and, and I heard it yesterday that someone was going in for a second opinion and the doctor said he was going to repeat everything. And that's what a second opinion is. I hate to say it. It's, it's, sometimes it's repeating everything. I, I just hate to say it. So if you go to another physician, so if you come to see me and I say, hey, I want to repeat these blood tests and I want to repeat these EMG, um, that's what a second opinion is. And you don't want me to rubber stamp. So if you came because you wanted validation, that's not a second opinion. That's validation, okay? If you're coming to me for a second opinion, I, in fact, I often tell patients, I don't even care what any other doctor told you. That's not my job to listen to what the other doctor told you. That's validation. And so, um, so if, 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 if a second opinion hasn't been done, or um, I, I would absolutely do that. That would be the other step. And I think any patient with, with IBM likely needs two pairs of eyes to look at them. And, and I granted, I heard it yesterday, two pairs of eyes looking at somebody means two different diagnoses, and all it does is make things more confusing. But that's not, it, we're all speaking the same language sometimes, whether it's, whether, um, you know, we call it IBM, uh, or we say you have IBM, but you don't have all the biopsy features for it, doesn't mean you don't have IBM, so. Uh, Dr. Well, we, I think I brought that up last time about sarcopenia. Because is that an age from disuse, age related, or is there, is that what? So, so, so there is an entity called sarcopenia, and, and, uh, and Linda said the word that doesn't include in it, which is disuse. So it's not because of disuse. Sarcopenia is not because you're not exercising. That, that, and I'm sure you guys have heard that too, that, that hey, you're weak because you're not exercising. No, 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 no. you're weak because there's something wrong with your muscles. Um, exercise can help that, but that's not the cause. And I think that that can be a damaging statement to imply that you did something to cause this. That's not the, the case. Right. So, so, so sarcopenia is an entity that, that exists. It's an entity of getting uh, age-associated muscle weakness that can happen. And what, it, what happens is, is as people get older, um, there is an entity of, of, of losing muscle mass and becoming weaker. Those patients don't necessarily have difficulty getting up out of a chair in a very stereotyped manner. Those patients don't necessarily have finger flexor weakness. They have kind of diffuse diffuse weakness. Um, and, and so um, is that a normal part of aging? Well, I just called it something that sounds like a medical condition. I called it sarcopenia. So it's not a normal part of aging. Is it, do, does it happen in a, a, an appreciable amount of older people and may every patient as they get older develop sarcopenia? That's quite possible. People would say that everybody, if they live long enough, will develop dementia. But that, that, that doesn't mean that that's our default goal. 
Um, and so, so I, I think th those words out there about sarcopenia make people think that that's actually an accepted thing that happens, and I don't think it necessarily is. Huh. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't. I don't think we know the full full answer to that. Um, I don't think we know uh, the answers to um, environmental exposures. Often, often I hear patients talk about, you know, oh, it was the mosquito spray that did it, and oh, it was uh, Agent Orange that did it. And, and I often reflect back to them and ask them why, at this point, is it so important to know what you were exposed to that caused it? Because it clearly didn't cause, Agent Orange didn't cause IBM in every, every uh, uh, person over in, in Vietnam. And insect spray clearly doesn't cause IBM in most patients. Whether it caused it in you, I don't know the answer, but why is that an important question at, at that point. And I think a lot of it has to do with people racking their brain thinking, what did I do? What did I do? How can I control this? And the truth is, is you have a disease and there's nothing you did. Um, and, and, and I think, uh, I, so I never want to see people get focused on what did I do? Um, uh, uh, often patients want to know exactly what can I exactly eat, and I often reflect back why why you know I promise you if there was some diet for IBM I wouldn't be hiding it from you, um, and so um, what is it about that? Is it that you want? I, I think people like to control their disease, and I get it. I understand that. I'm not criticizing it, but I just often try to reflect it back. Yeah, so I, I don't know about in you. All I can say is a lot of people ate mothballs. I guarantee it. A lot of kids eat mothballs, and, and, and we don't see uh, everyone having I, IBM. So, I, you know, could it be specific to you? Absolutely. I don't know the answer to that. Yes. Um, with everything you've been talking about, like the research and things like that, that's been going on you know, since 1979, what do you see, like the future? You know, I mean, is it looking better? Have you, um, has there been bigger gains in understanding it? Or do, we, do you feel that we're closer today to understanding what's going on versus what you did back then? Yeah, I, I do. I feel very positive about about um, about the state of things. I think that um, although it probably sounds like we've just made things more complicated and, and all of that, I think the end game is still how do we increase function and strength in patients with IBM. And I think that um, the fact that there have been so so I can tell you, like I said, there have been many clinical trials for for IBM. They've all focused on modulating the immune system. They've all given, you know, whatever chemotherapeutic drug has been used, they've tried it, and we're just moving over, stopping beating a dead horse. We're starting to use drugs that increase muscle mass, like a myostatin inhibitor. We're starting to use a drug that, you know, I don't, both of them were so quiet about their clinical trials. I don't quite know why, but, um, you know, we have another clinical trial for a drug which helps protein aggregation in the skeletal muscle. So I think, I think just the fact that we're trying new ideas is, is really exciting. Are they going to work? I, I don't know the answer. But we learn so much from every trial that's done. We learn what's the best outcome measure to use. We learn how long do we need to design a trial. Maybe for IBM, a clinical trial needs to be two years long before we would be able to see an effect. Or maybe, uh, maybe uh, if, if we look at patients who have NCT51A antibody status, we can actually use them because they progress in a different way. You know, so I, we're just learning so much. 
all the time. So, so I think any time there's a clinical trial, even though it may uh, not have met its primary endpoint, I think it's, it's exciting. It means that we're headed in the right, right direction. It means that drug companies are thinking about IBM, which is hugely important. It, and, and whenever that means they start thinking about it, so, so, I, so sometimes I'll talk to, um, to drug companies that are thinking about what, what, are the, what indications should we be thinking about as a, uh, as a company? And you know, what, what diseases should we be focusing on? And, and the things that are important are a disease that we know the natural history for, a disease that has a good patient advocacy group, the TMA being one, and, and why is that important? Because for a clinical trial for a rare disease like IBM, we have to be able to get the patients and identify them. A drug company can't spend all of its money uh, identifying patients. We need to, and, and you know, figuring out diagnosis and all that. So, so I think it's exciting. I think you know, even though, um, even though, uh, you know, th these may not have been positive trials, I think that, that it's exciting. So. Great, sure. Thank you.